So if you've made it to this video, I want to congratulate you because we've really described at this point all of thermodynamics. The potentials, the state variables, response functions, the relationships between them and each other is what makes thermodynamics up. The specific models that we inject, Einstein solid, ideal gas, Van der Waals model, those aren't really thermodynamics at their core, they're models that get plugged into the equations of thermodynamics to give us specific predictions. So what else can we do with thermodynamics? Well, we can kind of investigate the minor subtle details of specific models, and that's kind of fun, right? We could go look at phase transitions or some chemistry reactions and how they happen. Uh, we could also take a lot more measurements, right? Fill out our tables, go to the lab, figure out what is the thermal expansion coefficient of zinc metal at 900 Celsius or something like that. We could we could fill in our tables, um, but you know that's that's got a certain there's a certain deviation away from pure discovery with those. We are working within an accepted framework. Instead, we're going to turn our attention now for the rest of the course to the models and how we get them. And that means we're going to go back to statistical mechanics. We already had one version of statistical mechanics called the microcanonical ensemble. And it works well for certain systems. But it has that difficult part of it where we have to figure out the pattern for the multiplicity. It has all those factorials in it. And it's not guaranteed that we'll be clever enough to be able to do that for every system. But there are more powerful methods of statistical mechanics that are based on better fundamental principles and are less prone to getting ruined by difficult mathematics. The first one of these is called the canonical ensemble. And we'll start the canonical ensemble with one of its main ingredients, and that is called Boltzmann factors, or the Boltzmann distribution. First, we're going to derive the Boltzmann distribution, more or less, from the fundamental principle of statistical mechanics in the microcanonical ensemble. But once we have the Boltzmann distribution, we can then treat it as a fundamental starting place to build up this new kind of ensemble called the canonical ensemble. For deriving the Boltzmann distribution, we're going to imagine a reservoir labeled R that has a small system embedded within it called system A. When I say A is a small system, I mean that it's like the size of an atom or the size of a molecule. The point is that we can easily specify the microstates of system A. It doesn't have such an enormous multiplicity of its own that requires a lot of information. So we'll let K denote the microstate. of system A. And when system A is in the microstate K, we will let EK denote its energy. Now the reservoir and system A share energy. So the total energy U is equal to the energy in the microstate of A, E sub K, plus whatever energy is left in the reservoir as a result. Now to do statistical mechanics in the microcanonical ensemble, we have to consider multiplicities. The multiplicity of the overall system of the universe in this case will be equal to the multiplicity of the reservoir times the multiplicity of system A. But system A has its microstate exactly specified by the variable K. So the multiplicity of system A is actually just 1. Once we know K, whether it's a vector or a, a set of numbers, uh, a set of quantum numbers, it's definitely in that microstate. So there's no multiplicity. But for the multiplicity of the reservoir, there is some function, 
some complicated dependence on how much energy is in that reservoir. These considerations and the relationship of multiplicity to probability give us what is the starting point of the Boltzmann distribution. It's the probability of a microstate, K, occurring in the small system, A. This probability, in its first form, is equal to the multiplicity of the entire universe, given that the system is in microstate, K, with energy, K. Of course, probabilities must be normalized to 1, so we have some normalization factor here on the bottom, x, is chosen so that the sum of all probabilities is 1. So x is just some constant that may be difficult to calculate, but always exists. <coughs> now this probability is dependent on the total multiplicity, but essentially this only depends on the multiplicity of the reservoir because the multiplicity of the small system A is equal to 1. So now let's think about if we can deduce anything more about this formula for the probability just by thinking about the reservoir itself. Now generally we think of the reservoir as being large. So if the reservoir is large, then EK is much, much less than U. And this multiplicity function, omega sub r, is essentially continuous. Even though the multiplicity of system A changes, uh, the energy of system A changes in discrete jumps because k is a, you know, maybe quantum numbers or something, uh, the multiplicity of the reservoir is essentially continuous. So it may be possible to expand this multiplicity in a series with EK as a small parameter. Let's see what that gives us. Uh, for mathematical reasons, instead of expanding omega r, since that grows very rapidly with energy, I'm going to expand its logarithm instead. So let's consider the logarithm of u minus ek, where u is a constant and ek is a small number. So the first term in this uh, series expansion is just uh, the multiplicity at um, the energy u. That's just some constant. The next term is going to be the derivative with respect to u of the logarithm of the multiplicity of u and multiplied by negative ek because there's a minus sign here and this is the uh, function we're expanding. Now there may be more terms here with second derivatives but one can easily prove that those are uh, seriously negligible uh, compared to this first and second term in the expansion. In fact, you can prove that uh, the terms in this expansion are of order n, uh, where n is the size of the system for the first one, of order 1, so intensive for the second term, and of order 1 over n, 1 over n squared, 1 over n cubed for the rest. So in a large system where n is the size of Adler's number, this is accurate to one part in 10 to the 22nd. So this term here is not a constant. We have a minus ek multiplied by this derivative. Now, we know something about this derivative. The logarithm of multiplicity is related to the entropy of the system. In fact, it's equal to the, the logarithm of multiplicity is equal to the entropy divided by a constant, Boltzmann's constant. So logarithm of omega is s over k. 
And now we're to take the derivative of s over k with respect to u. Well, in the microcanonical ensemble, which is what we're working at with multiplicities, that derivative is just 1 over the temperature. So this derivative here, the derivative of log of omega with respect to u, is equal to 1 over kt. And we're quite pleased to see Boltzmann's constant and temperature show up in here because we know that kt appears in a lot of thermodynamic models. So what we get here is our logarithm of multiplicity is approximately equal to some constant minus the energy of the microstate k divided by kt. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that as the small system gains more energy, the reservoir gets less energy, and so the multiplicity of the reservoir must decrease. Therefore, microstates with low energy are more probable because the reservoir gets... Uh, so, so microstates with more energy are less probable because the reservoir doesn't have as many ways to arrange itself in that system. So now that we've got this expression for the logarithm of the multiplicity, let's plug that in to our expression for probability. To do that, we'll need the uh, take the exponential of both sides of this, so we'll get uh, some other constant multiplied by the exponential of e uh, exponential of minus e k over k t. This means that the probability now is equal to 1 over some constant times e to the minus e k over k t. And this is what we uh, call the Boltzmann distribution. We're going to change the name of this constant now, since it's in the right place, to a capital Z. And this is the Boltzmann distribution. says that the probability of observing a small system in a microstate K when it's immersed in the reservoir of temperature T is proportional to the exponential of the negative energy of that microstate divided by KT. This part right here, just the exponential E to the minus EK over KT is called a Boltzmann factor. And the normalization constant, capital Z, is called the partition function. Remember, the value of Z is chosen so that the sum of all probabilities is equal to 1. Therefore, Z is equal to the sum over all microstates of the small system A of the Boltzmann factors. This sum could be difficult to calculate but a value for z always exists, in principle. So the Boltzmann distribution uh, explains the small system in quite a different way than we did in the microcanonical ensemble. It specifies a temperature t, looks at the possible energies here, and tells us that the energies that are high are less likely, energies that are low are more likely. Let's do an example where we use the Boltzmann distribution. An atom has energy levels available to it of negative 8 electron volts for a ground state negative 4 electron volts for the first excited state, and negative 3 electron volts for the second excited state. These are all negative because the system is a bound atom. If we take this atom
and put it in a plasma at a temperature of 30,000 Kelvin, what are the probabilities for this atom to be found in the ground state, the first excited state, or the uh, second excited state? Uh, no other states are considered to be allowed in this problem. So our method for solving this will be first to calculate the energy value of kT. And to do this, it's useful to know the value of Boltzmann's constant in units of electron volts. It's 8.614 times 10 to the minus 5 electron volts per Kelvin. And therefore, when we go to calculate E0 over kT, we can first get kT in electron volts easily and then cancel the units of the energies uh, one for one. So E0 over kT will be minus 3.0957. E1 over kT will be minus 1.5479. And E2 over kT will be minus 1.1609. Now that we've got those three energy ratios, we can calculate the Boltzmann factors. Of each state. So we basically take the exponential E raised to this power. Uh, raised to the uh, this uh, raised to negative this power. So E to the 3.0957 that gives us 22.102. For E1, it gives us 4.7015. And for E2, it gives us 3.1928. Uh, just a reminder that these are E to the negative energy over KT. So those are our Boltzmann factors. And our next step is to determine our partition function. We add these three numbers together. Those are all the Boltzmann factors. And here is where it's important that we say these are the only three allowed states. Adding these together gives us 29.996 for our normalization constant or Boltzmann uh, our, uh, partition function. Finally, we take our Boltzmann factors, divide them by the partition function to get the probabilities. So the probability of state, uh, the ground state is 0.737, probability of the first excited state is 0.157, and the probability of the second, state, the second excited state is 0.106. Right. So even at this high temperature, it's still quite probable to find this atom in its ground state, and quite less probable to find it in the second excited state. Right, so that gives an uh, example of how to use the Boltzmann distribution and what it really means as far as calculating probabilities. Now there is one additional subtlety which I will make you aware of, and that is the question of degeneracy. So degeneracy is a situation where there are a certain a number of microstates that give the same energy. So you could imagine here an atom that is not in a magnetic field. Uh, would have an energy based off of its n quantum number, but the energy does not depend on the l or m quantum numbers. So those states are uh, called degenerate. The same, uh, there are different 
um, different microstates, different microstate values K, actually end up giving you the same energy, EK. Uh, so the degeneracy value, GK, is an integer that counts how many microstates have the same energy. In that case, the probability of observing the energy EK would be larger because there could be multiple microstates giving you that same energy. So our probability would be G okay, over Z times the Boltzmann factor. Uh, and this is then viewed as, sorry, a probability of observing the energy EK. The probability of observing the microstate K is still given by the Boltzmann distribution, but the probability of observing the energy is now larger because there are multiple ways to do it. So I apologize that this GK is not related to the Gibbs energy at all. It's just a uh, conventional notation for the number of uh, degenerate states. So let's do an example for this. Uh, an atom has a uh, rotational energy levels and rotational energy levels are characterized by two quantum numbers L and M. If you remember your hydrogen atom, L is called the angular momentum quantum number it has to be positive, and M is called the azimuthal quantum number, the z-direction quantum number, and it has to be between negative L and positive L. Uh, so a choice of L and a choice of M that satisfy those two conditions, integers for L and M, is telling us what rotational state that atom is in. Uh, quantum mechanics then tells us that the energy of a specific rotational level is equal to uh, Planck's constant squared times L times L plus 1 over twice the moment of inertia of that rotation. So uh, moment of inertia of an atom is you know not something that can be easily observed, but let's uh, say we've figured it out indirectly for uh, this specific atom, h bar squared over 2i is equal to 0 0.0035 electron volts. I imagine that that's a, a more or less typical value for realistic atoms. And you can think of this as just an energy constant for the uh, energy spectrum. So let's uh, ask a question now. Uh, find the relative probability of an L equals 3 state versus an L equals 2 state at a temperature of 500 Kelvin. Now we're only looking for relative probability here, so we don't need to calculate the partition function this time. And in effect, it would be impossible to do it exactly because of this L times L plus 1 in the exponent. Uh, but let's, we will be able to calculate this relative probability. So let's look at the solution. So the L states are degenerate, right? For each choice of L, there's a number of M choices which will give us the same energy because energy does not depend on M. Uh, in fact, there are 2L plus 1 possible values for M that uh, fit between minus L and positive L. 2L for each side, uh, plus 1 for M equals 0. So our G value, our degeneracy for L equals 2 states is 5, and our degeneracy for L equals 3 states is 7. All right. Uh, so the relative probability then, P3 over P2, will be equal to uh, 7 times exponential of minus E3 over KT divided by 5 times the exponential of minus E2 over KT. 
and the, the E3 and the E2, let's see. For E3, we would use this energy constant, and we would plug in 3 for L. So 3 times 3 plus 1 is 3 times 4 is equal to 12. And for E2, then that would come out to uh, 2 times 3 is 6. Alright, so I'm not going to go through the uh, numerics of plugging in the h bar squared over 2i and the, uh, and the kd, uh, but these Boltzmann factors come out to uh, 0 0.377 for the L equals 3 value of energy and 0 0.64 for uh, 6141 for the uh, L equals 2 energy state. All right, and the ratio of these is uh, 0.859. All right, so what that means is that for every atom in an L equals 2 state, there are on average 0.859 atoms in the L equals 3 state. So we get that relative probability here from the Boltzmann factors and the degeneracy values. A special case of the Boltzmann distribution is when we apply it to an ideal gas. When we apply a Boltzmann distribution to an ideal gas, it still really is a Boltzmann distribution. But for, for historical and naming reasons, it's called a Maxwell distribution. So how do we apply a Boltzmann distribution to the ideal gas? Well, in this case, our microsystem is one molecule in the gas. And that molecule means that our K value is three real numbers. The X, Y, and Z components of the molecules, uh, momentum, and possibly some additional rotational quantum numbers uh, if there is um, a possibility for the atom to rotate possibly some additional vibrational quantum numbers if the, there's a possibility for the atom to vibrate. Let's go through this first for a uh, molecule with no internal motions though, just three components of velocity. So our energy in this case is just the kinetic energy of that velocity vector, and then our probability from the Boltzmann distribution is the exponential of minus mv squared, and this is vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared over 2kt. And then, of course, there is some normalization factor here, uh, which we won't calculate at the moment. All right, so this is the Maxwell distribution for a velocity vector with components Vx, Vy, and Vz. And uh, we can notice here that this has a, quite a pleasing form to it. We have essentially uh, what is called a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution or a, a bell curve, with large velocities being less probable and velocity components near zero being more probable. If you remember um, what a Gaussian distribution looks like, it is something like that. So along one axis, say Vx, we've got a distribution of uh, velocities that is highly peaked around zero. Uh, the other interesting part about this distribution is it has a, uh, a width 
right? The width of this, the standard deviation of the distribution is determined by the temperature and the mass of the molecules. So sigma squared uh, for velocities is equal to Kp over m. Right? So for a hotter temperature, this distribution becomes wider and there are sort of a larger spread of uh, randomized velocities. So this really gives us a very uh, a nice insight into what's going on in an ideal gas. The molecules, we know that they're moving around randomly, but how are they moving? Well, this is the distribution of velocities. It's likely for one velocity component to be close to zero, and it's less likely for a velocity component to be very, very large. There is some, you know, uh, average velocity component and some width to the distribution that is determined by the temperature. Uh, now, to calculate the normalization factor here, we have to do a integral. Since the Vs are continuous, the set of all possible microstates is the set of all possible real numbers in a triplet, Vx, Vy, Vz. So our normalization factor will be an integral over all possible x values. all possible y component values and all possible z values. And the integrand is the Boltzmann factor. Uh, now, when we see an integral that's a triple integral, there is a tendency to, you know, kind of throw up our hands and defeat. But the form of this integral is actually very simple because of the rules of exponentials. e to the sum of two things is equivalent to the exponential of the product. So this integral is equivalent to the product of three integrals. e to the minus mv squared over 2kt dv done once and then cubed. Now this integral is also, uh, you know, we still have to do that, but there's, um, there's a whole literature for these types of integrals that involve the exponential of minus the variable squared, and they're called Gaussian integrals. And uh, the first, um, you, you can, of course, work these out by hand once or twice, but there is a, a section of integral tables for these that can be quite handy. So here we have an integral of the form e to the minus ax squared dx. Um, here v is playing the role of x, and a uh, is the constant m over 2kt. So this integral, if you look it up in a table or do it uh, by hand once, has the value of root pi over a. Uh, so if we use this in our formula for the normalization factor, we're going to get uh, 2 pi kt over m to the uh, 3 halves power. All right, so that's our normalization factor for the Boltzmann distribution of velocities. <clears throat> uh, the quantity 2 pi kt over m raised to the 3 halves power. So that means this distribution then, for a given velocity vector, has the exact form m over 2 pi kt, exponential of minus m, and I'll just write it this time as v squared, over 2kt. So we square the whole velocity vector to get that. Okay, so, so this is the Maxwell distribution of velocities, and it tells us that a velocity near zero is the most likely. But this distribution has some symmetry to it, right? 
Vx, Vy, and Vz all appear in the same way. So we could swap x and y subscripts, or we could maybe rotate y and z uh, into each other. Uh, we could choose any different coordinate system basically for x, y, and z, and it would have the same exact formula there. So the distribution is not really dependent on the direction of the velocity vector. It's only dependent on its magnitude. If you take any vector, and add up its squares, that gives you the magnitude of the vector. So a very useful way to reinterpret the Maxwell distribution is as a distribution over speeds rather than a distribution of a three-dimensional velocity vector. So we don't have to do the entire problem again. We have the same distribution here. But now we need to think of it in terms of a speed. So a speed, v, is equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vc squared. It's the magnitude of that velocity vector. And so to get the distribution of speeds, what we need to do is take the integral or add up the contribution of all velocities that have the same speed. So that can be kind of difficult, right? We've got to integrate this over all possible combos of vx, vy, and vz that end up giving us the same speed. Hard to do if we think of it x, y, and z. But it's a lot easier to do if we interpret this velocity vector in terms of spherical coordinates, a magnitude and two direction angles, theta and phi. So in that case, our integrand, our integral is still a, uh, our integral is a double integral over the surface of a sphere in velocity space. So we have a v squared sine theta d theta d phi as our element of area on the surface of a sphere. The phi as Muthel angle goes from 0 to 2 pi. The theta um, uh, the theta angle goes the, it was an inclination angle, right? It goes from 0 to pi. Right? And uh, then we've got our this is our Boltzmann uh, distribution in velocities plugged in right there. Right, so this, in terms of the uh, spherical coordinates, we'll still have the normalization factor. And then our exponential is only dependent on the speed squared. It doesn't depend on the angle of the velocity at all. All right, so these two integrals here only hit theta and phi. Theta and phi don't occur in any other terms. So these integrals are actually quite trivial. They just give us the surface area of a sphere, which is 4 pi v squared. So our distribution of speeds is 4 pi v squared times m or 2 pi kt to the 3 halves power exponential of minus m v squared over 2 kt. So this distribution looks a bit different. If we plot versus speed, it starts low, has a maximum, and then has an exponential or Gaussian tail. The most likely probability, or the most likely speed, is at the top of this. But the uh, you know the average speed. or the uh, root mean squared speed is at some place different. Uh, if we integrate this <coughs> over all speeds, you can check that it's equal to 1. So if we take this PV, if we integrate that over all speeds, that's equal to 1. If we calculate this uh, average speed, the root mean squared speed. Uh, so, oh yeah, uh, root 
of the mean squared speed. Uh, we get, we'll have to do one of these Gaussian integrals, right? We multiply this um, whole thing by v squared and then integrate it over all positive v's. Uh, then we will get square root of 8 kt over pi m. And if we go and calculate this uh, most probable speed by taking the derivative of this and setting it equal to zero, then we will get square root of 2 kt over m. All right, so, so, so these are similar, right? 8 over pi is kind of close to 2, but they're not exactly the same. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why the distribution has this shape. Um, didn't I just claim that velocities near zero were more likely? Well, yes, they still are. But there's only one velocity vector that is right at zero. If we look for velocity vectors that have a magnitude of two, each individual velocity vector of magnitude two is less likely to occur than a velocity of exactly zero. But there are many more velocities of magnitude 2 at different directions that could exist. So this factor here, the 4 pi v squared, is like a degeneracy factor. There are many speed values that would produce the same energy. Many velocity vectors, sorry, that would produce the same energy. 4 pi v squared of them, in fact. So there's a competition here between having a large degeneracy and having a small Boltzmann factor. So that's why we get the growth due to growing uh, degeneracy, 4 pi v squared, and then eventually we get the shrinking just due to you know exponentials kind of win over everything else at large values. Right? So this tells us that in a gas, if we look at the speeds of the molecules, that they're you know clustered around some uh, most probable speed or some RMS speed, and it's much less likely for a molecule to have low speed or a molecule to have really high speed. Like we can answer all sorts of questions about how many molecules would you expect to find in a certain range of speeds. Another wonderful prediction of this, qualitative at this point, it has to do with chemical reactions, especially in a gas. If we think about what it takes to do a chemical reaction, two molecules need to collide with each other. They need to be close together. And they also need to be moving fast enough to overcome energy barriers and get those atoms close together. If the gas is at low temperature, then there aren't many molecules that are moving very fast, fast enough to react. But as we raise the temperature, this distribution widens and pushes more molecules to high speed, where it's more likely they'll react if they collide. Therefore, the rate of chemical reactions in gases can usually be related to this RMS value, square root of temperature, or the RMS speed of the molecules. As that goes higher, more reactions are likely to occur. Now, the last fact that I would like to derive from this is an important linkage to our next topic. For this probability distribution, it is also possible to calculate the average value of the energy for molecules in the gas we would just need to take the expectation value of the energy, 1 half mv squared dv. So here's our probability density function. Here is our um, microscopic quantity. And we'll find the expected value of the energy by doing this integral. Well, if you work out this integral, what you will find is that the 1 half m can be moved to the front. The 4 pi 
and the m over 2 pi kt can be moved to the front. And the integration can be done with a substitution that results in uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 powers of v outside of the exponential in the integrand and a v squared in the integrand. So this 2 kt over m is the key variable there. Or, so sorry, 2 kt over m is the key uh, constant there. So we have uh, 4 v's outside, so we get 2 kt over m to the 5 halves power. Um, that's not obvious, but you have to look at the integral table for these Gaussian integrals. Uh, and then the integral itself has a value of, uh, after that substitution, of 3 root pi over 8. Okay, so isn't that a lovely expression for the average value of the energy? Well, I think so. Let's see if we can't maybe simplify this a little bit. Let's see. So we've got an m to the first power, an m to the 3 halves power, and an m to the negative 5 halves power. So all m's are gone. Then we have a pi to the first power, a pi to the negative 3 halves power, and a pi to the positive 1 half power. So all the pi's are gone. What about the kt's? Here's a kt to the minus 3 halves power and a kt to the positive 5 halves power. So there will be one factor of kt left over. Then the last thing are the integers. So a 1 half and a 4 makes a 2. 2 to the 5 halves over 2 to the 3 halves gives us another 2. So we've got a 2 up here. A 2 up here makes 4. 3 over 8 times 4 is 3 over 2. It's kind of a miracle. The average energy per particle in the ideal gas is 3 halves kT. The same thing we got from our very first molecular model. So this shows that this Maxwell distribution can tell us a lot more about the ideal gas than any of our previous microscopic models did. It won't give us any results that contradict the ideal gas law or the ideal gas Sacker-Tetrode equation, but now we know so much more about what the actual molecules are doing in this system. So finally, I'll conclude. These distributions can tell us about probabilities, and they can tell us about expectation values or average values, but the result that the average expected energy matches what we got for microscopic models previously and for thermodynamic models leads us to believe that there should be a general connection between, max, between Boltzmann distributions and the thermodynamic potentials. A way of taking Boltzmann factors and putting them together to generate a thermodynamic model. And that will be the topic of the next video.